Um, my heroine in Follow Me Darkly, I, I always have, I always write about, about strong women. Um, this this particular heroine though is very type A, um, likes to be in charge of everything to the point where she won't even allow herself to get drunk because she just doesn't want to lose control. So coming up upon this alpha billionaire guy who um, also <laughs> is very controlling and um, uh, in all aspects of his life, um, they butted heads. And, um, you know, she didn't just hop in the sack with him right away. Um, like, you know, I mean, who are we kidding? Most of us would probably just go for the billionaire hot alpha guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it was, I found it absolutely fun to write this book. Um, these two characters, I have two more books in this series where I get to explore these characters further. And um, actually, I've, I've already written both of them. And this was one of the most fun, exciting series I've worked on in a while. So um, can't beat the alpha billionaire, I'm telling you. <laughs> it was really, the power dynamic is really what started the whole series. I had actually been looking through book titles and, and looking through books. And I thought I'd seen one that was said the billionaire's prince. And I thought, well, what's that? That must be a male, male book. And I realized very quickly as a lifelong feminist <laughs> with a lot of shame that I had assumed the billionaire prince, that the billionaire had to be a man. And that is where all this entire series and this whole thing came from, that the assumption that the billionaire had to be a man. And, and so I quickly said, what does it look like when a woman is the billionaire, when she has the power? What does that power, power dynamic look like? And what does it look like when a woman is that um, has that many resources and is that empowered to make decisions? How does she do it differently than a prototypical? Obviously, all of the characters we're writing, we try to make them unique in their own. But how does a woman with a billionaire and, and she's self-made, so it's not an heiress, it's not a person who's grown up with this kind of money and resources. How does it look different when a woman does it, when a woman has that kind of power? And that's really what drove the entire series is how does it look when a woman does it? And again, when she's paired with an equally, not equal, but also a powerful, confident man who the, the one thing that never comes into play with the power dynamic of these two people is her power. They have lots of problems. There's a ton of things in my books, but one of the things he's never threatened by is her innate power. That's something that generally really turns him on, but there's always lots of other complications beyond that. So yeah, power, the power dynamic there with billionaires was exactly what drove this whole thing. What's it look like when a woman's got it? I think she actually kind of usually does it better. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always gonna go last because I'm literally like listening to you like, okay, I'm just gonna take notes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't have to always go last, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can we talk for a minute about research? Because you guys all had some very different professions in your books. And <laughs> it was fascinating because I felt like at the end of it, I'd actually learned a lot about those careers without feeling like I'd been reading dry nonfiction about those careers. So obviously, you did a lot of research into what those things were were. Um, and I assume, Julie, that some of yours was from being a lawyer, you had some experience with law enforcement, because that's a lot of the detail that went into your book. A, a little bit, yeah, yeah. I've done, um, I've done, I did a little bit of criminal work, but only in law school. So it's been a really long time. I, I, I interned for the, well, not just in law school, I interned for the U.S. Attorney's Office um, when I was in law school and worked with, really closely with the DEA because it was a very small office. So it was me, the Assistant U.S. Attorney and a DEA agent in the office. And so I was doing pretty much everything. And then I clerked on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So I read a lot of appellate work, um, appellate briefs that dealt with uh, criminal cases um, and, and a lot of of death penalty cases. So I got law enforcement from that side. Um, but when I actually started practicing, I had a huge gap of years where I wasn't really doing anything, but I've always read um, procedurals, you know, outside of romance, just procedural mysteries, procedural thrillers. Um, and I've done a lot of research. I did one series, um, I, if you guys have read my work or, or not, it's, it's one of my favorite series because it's like my most taboo because the hero and heroine are brother and sister, but it's called um, Dirtiest Secret. And there was a scene I had to research. I had to know what the FBI would do 
um, if, if somebody wanted to keep a kidnapping, like a billionaire wanted to keep a kidnapping away from the press. So I called the FBI and asked, I'm like, okay, I'm not kidnapping anybody, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm really not kidnapping anybody. Please don't come to my house. But what would the procedure be? Would they have, you know, are, are they obligated to like answer questions? And, you know, so I've gotten to where I just, you know, if I have questions, I, I call and, and, um, and, and do a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, you, you, you kind of wonder what, you know, people looking, you know, people are watching our internet research. Oh, They're looking God. at my research oh, my going, God. who is Me this too. person? <laughs> I, I, I think about that all the time, you yeah. know, and I do a lot of, hum a lot of three, two, two series. And then every, another series every once in a while has a lot of human trafficking type issues going on in the background. And, um, yeah, so I figure, you know, any minute now, someone's coming knocking on my door. <laughs> it's just, they're going to probably it, it, knock on mine first because uh, uh, my 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 most successful series, uh, human trafficking, is a huge theme in it, <laughs> and, and I've done all the research. And were you done, Julie? I don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I want to like uh, I ramble so plow over you, but um, yeah, um, I obviously yeah we have to, you have to do a lot of research because you want it to be realistic. Um, the last thing you need in a review is people saying, oh, this would never happen. Well, they do that anyway. So, but you know, you want to, I think it's important to have um, as realistic a perspective as you can when you're writing contemporary fiction of any kind. So, so yeah, um, no, no human trafficking in this particular series, <laughs> but in others I've, I've had to, um, I've had to research that I've had to research how to commit a murder, you know, um, what would, ha what happens when you stab someone, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, our, uh, our search, um, <laughs> histories, <laughs> uh, I don't know who's yeah. watching, but whatever, but for, this <laughs> particular, <laughs> for this particular book, um, I did do a little research on, um, the heroine's, uh, career, which turns out to be, she's getting into Instagram influencing and, um, I didn't know anything about that. I mean, I, I do have a lot of Instagram followers, although Julie kicks my ass. She's got like 20,000. I've got like 12,000, but, <laughs> um, but you know, I'm not an influencer and I'm, I'm an author. So I did a little research on that, but honestly, most of my research was on the BDSM aspects because I wanted to do it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to make sure that it was realistically portrayed. So that was another, you know, another little uh, thing in my search history. <laughs> I, I got fortunate. So when I was titled The Billionaire's Prince, that turned into lush money. But the title occurred to me, and I was actually at my parents celebrating Christmas, and my parents own a vineyard. We grow Pinot Noir grapes in the Russian River Valley, and we, we don't make our own wine. We sell them to winemakers, but we've been wine growers since um, 2009. We're called Gantz Family Vineyards. And um, so I was there, and so I had my billionaire, female billionaire, and the billionaire's prince, and I'm thinking the prince okay, what's on the line for him? Like what's interesting? And I'm sitting outside in December in Sonoma County. So it's beautiful. And I'm like, so the prince, I'm writing a little synopsis on my phone just because it's all occurring. And I so the prince has a, and I look up and I'm like, his kingdom is based on vineyards. Cause <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so the whole idea became that there was this, I studied in Spain in college and so but they had a vineyard, or excuse me, a, a small kingdom in the mountains of northern Spain based historically on these beautiful wine grapes they grow, these Tempranillo wine grapes, and that they, you know, would, 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 you know, give them to the royal family or sell them to the royal family, and that this, over the years, this, this kingdom has become less and less important and, and is near destitution, and he needs to come back and save it. So he's a wine grower it's called a viticulturist so it's somebody who is into the vine science his sister sophia is a winemaker she is the the heroine of hay crush the second book and um and so my books are about either wine growing or about winemaking and it's getting frisky in the vineyards and you know it's an it's this beautifully so there's no human trafficking but i now know that i need to figure I, there actually is in the third book there is a whole romantic suspense element <laughs> was actually like you got to pull back this is not a romantic suspense <laughs> so, uh, but yeah no so uh mine's all wine growing but I got kind of a lucky break that my uh, family uh does it so I just got to ask friends and family lots of questions can we be like best friends <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> I have 850 Instagram followers so I'm up for it <laughs> 
<laughs> I've always wanted to learn about wine. I did one wine book and, and toured a, a, a winery, but it was before iPhones and all that stuff. So I didn't really have a good record. And my memory is there are machines and people pick grapes and they put it all together and you get really tasty wine. And then we drank afterwards too, which probably kind of killed some of the brain cells of the research, <laughs> but it was really, it was really fun. <laughs> It's been lovely. I've had a, a couple. I've had a good romance friend, Andy J. Christopher, did use some of the background on our website for her book. And then another friend, Eva Moore, came and toured. And then Reese Ryan is talking about a series. And so I'm nice. like, yeah, I'm totally pimping my whole vineyard and family out. Like, why? <laughs> I love it. That's so great. <laughs> okay. So why romance? Like what drew you guys to writing romance? I know you get that question all the time, but I'm always curious. I mean, were you just passionate about reading romance and so it seemed natural? I will, I will take the pressure off and just go ahead and, and, and answer uh, first this question. I had been, um, I've been a romance reader since I was in the sixth grade and, you know, voracious reader in the eighth grade. I moved to San Francisco and there was a massive mean girl situation. And the only thing that allowed me mentally any release from just kind of the mean girls was grabbing a romance book and taking it in my room with a bag of ruffles. And that's what I would do for the next six hours. Because the thing about situations that are difficult to get out of is a lot of times you can't change them. You just have to bear them. And I understood that in eighth grade that I needed to bear the situation and romance novels were the one thing that provided self-care and that level of release. And so was a fan all the way through high school and college, became a journalist and, but wasn't talking about it and wasn't proud of my romance reading. And it was my mid twenties and I don't know what did it, but finally I was like, this, this genre is so valuable. It is so um, inspiring. It is so much about the woman's journey and her right to find pleasure her right to find self, her right to find a mate who respects her and values her pleasure. And at that point, I was like, I'm not ashamed of this anymore. And so I've been writing since my mid 20s. I didn't publish until my mid 40s. But um, I am just a, an enormous champion of the genre as pleasure and escapism and self care being something that's incredibly innately important to people. So that's why. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with you on, um, well, pretty much everything. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I want to talk about the stigma that is associated with romance. Um, and I choose to look at it another way because I don't really care. I, I am proud of what I do. Uh, I've had, uh, I'm Julie and Angelina even, I'm sure that you've had um, emails from readers who have been moved by your books. I had one reader say one of my books saved her life, which I think is a pretty powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I get asked this all the time what do you do about the stigma of romance? I'm like, I don't care about the stigma of romance. I'm proud of what I do. Romance is the best selling uh, genre of fiction in the United States. So we must be doing something right. And um, to, so to, to get back to your question, Anna, why romance? Um, I have been reading romance since I was in middle school and I'm gonna show my age here, but I found the old malt shop romances. Is any, do any of you guys remember those? You're probably not as old as I am. Um, they were written in the 40s and 50s by Rosamond Dujardin and Anne Emery and Betty Cavanna. Um, I fell in love with those um, in middle school. And then a friend of mine brought in a couple of those old Harlequins. Um, and back then they only had the regular Harlequin romance. Remember the, the colorful covers? Um, and so then I got hooked on those. Then I read a, a classic, Forever by Judy Bloom. We read that one, classic. So I've been reading romance forever. And um, I wasn't sure when I started my writing journey, I've wanted to write seriously my whole life, but I didn't actually get serious about it until about 2008. And um, I started um, writing uh, a sci-fi, or not a sci-fi, a fantasy YA story featuring my children and my nieces. <laughs> that was kind of fun. And um, then I picked up a, a Nora Roberts book uh, for a plane ride. Um, and I hadn't read romance in, in several years at that point. I picked up a Nora Roberts book for a plane ride and I totally fell in love all over again. I was like, you know what? This is what I need to be writing. So I switched over to romance and that's what I write. I came um, um, <clears throat> late to romance. I used to live, I, I've read everything for I mean, just anything that was sitting around the house or whatever, I would read it. I, I, my grandmother had 
Agatha Christie and Greek mythology. And I would spend summers with her and that was pretty much what I read. And so I read everything and I go to the library and the library behind our house when I was in sixth grade, sixth, seventh and eighth was in a strip shopping center and they, they alphabetized the books. They didn't divide, except in fiction and nonfiction was the only division. So you weren't like looking for kids books. You weren't looking for, you were just looking for books. So I never really thought of books in genre. So I say that I didn't read romance early, but I'm sure I did read some, but I just didn't think of them as, as, as romances. Um, but I always wanted to be a writer. It's my earliest memory. And, you know, rah, 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 didn't become a writer, journalism <laughs> school, film school, graduated, didn't have a good job. Oh, I'll go to law school. Oh, this worked out well. So ended up in LA and I was at a huge firm and I was bummed that I didn't have any time for a creative outlet. So I went to a smaller firm, still bummed I didn't have any time for a creative outlet because lawyer, um, but I really wanted to write and I um, thought I'd write a legal thriller and it was terrible. I mean, it wasn't thrilling at all. And you know, John Grisham and everybody were doing their thing back then. and. Um, one day I was uh, sitting in the break room with my friend Barbara and wanted to talk to her. And she was like, don't talk to me, I'm reading. And I'm like, <sighs> and she's like, here, read a book too. And she pulls out of her tote bag, Julie Gar one of Julie Garwood's books. And I wish I could remember which one it was because I literally glommed every single one of them like within a week. But, um, but I read it and I fell in love with it. And I'd been listening in audiobook form because my commute was so horrible. Um, can follow its pillars of the earth. And I thought, I will write a medieval romance. That's what I will do. I will write a medieval, because this is wonderful. And I realized that I couldn't research this because I didn't have time to go to the library. Google didn't exist. The internet was a CDOS prompt, you know? And 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 so I'm complaining a few weeks later after having gotten 90 pages into a historical romance. It's actually really fun. I found it in my garage last week, believe it or not. It has like nine points of view, including the bird flying over the scene. It was terrible, but but it was fun. Um, so I go to Barbara and I'm like, I don't, I, I got to this point in the book and I don't know the history. You know, I don't have, I don't have a head for historical facts and woe is me. What am I going to do? I love these books. I've read Julie Garvin's backlist. I've read like all the historicals that are in the bookstores. What am I going to do? And she's like, you know, that there are contemporary romances too. Right. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and she like this revelation and she pulls out of her magic tote bag. I kid you not. I'm not even exaggerating. Um, a Harlequin Temptation. It was, uh, this one I do remember, it was Vicki Lewis Thompson's Mr. Valentine. And I read it instead of working with my office door closed, like I was really, really busy reading the depositions I was supposed to be reading. And I loved it. And so I decided to write, and, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Harlequin category romances, they're about half the length of a traditional length novel, at least back then. Back then, traditional books tended to be around 100,000 words and the Harlequins were about 50,000. And I'm like, it's half, it's half the length. This is even better because I might, I have time is so rare. And so I sat down to write a contemporary romance and um, I had some interest from Harlequin. An editor liked my voice, but she was like, you didn't really do any market research. This isn't really a Harle It was an underwater archeologist and a documentary filmmaker, which if those of you who read, knew the temptation line, that was not the temptation line. <laughs> and so she said, try again, give me a sexy hook. So I'm like, okay, I'll give you a sexy hook. And I came up with something that was very Remington steel and she bought it. So that was my first book. And then at the same time, then I, in the meantime, I discovered other stuff. So I sold a paranormal romance um, about the same time that was published that was uh, with Dorchester. So it was a full length novel. So I sort of did category and single title for, um, a long time there, but I came in through the back door. I just wanted to write stuff, you know, I just wanted to tell stories and, um, and that's how I got into it. And now I've written a lot of romances and a lot of sci-fi fantasy, but mostly romances. Okay, so all of these series are contemporary and none of them are done. So I assume you're all working on the next books at this point. How is it writing contemporary in the time of COVID? Has it been diff? Are you just ignoring it all together? Are you worried it. about that? Okay. For this year, because I started it before COVID and the time is passing. It's a really condensed time frame in Booklandia. So it, it's, yeah, I just, I, I actually, but I thought about it. I did. It's like, what do I do? And I decided that in the world that they live in, it's the reader can assume it's before COVID because it was. <laughs> Yeah, same thing. I had already written the first book uh, and was actually working on the second mm -hmm. when uh, the pandemic 
started. So yeah. Yeah. You know what? Romance is all about escape. We don't mm-hmm. want to talk about COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and how sexy is it? You know, I removed my mask and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't want to go there. So I had written the, th- I'd written the third book and, and in for, in for edits, my revision was like, there, it's too heavily romantic suspense. We need to pull back a little bit on that because again, it's not a romantic suspense series. And I understood that. And so I'm in the midst of revisions now, but what I really was able to glom on is, is taking my hero and making him a little bit less angsty. And what I told my editor was he can provide comfort. Like I, I, you know, I can see the revisions pretty clearly because this hero can comfort me during pand- the pandemic. The idea that this book is gonna be coming out when it's, we're unfortunately probably still gonna be in this mess and that he can provide that he's this big, strong guy who's gonna come save me mm-hmm. from the pandemic. And that if I feel that way about him, my readers are gonna feel that way. And she was like, no, that's great. You've got a great vision. And she said, but just, just to be 90, you know, 100% clear He's not actually saving anybody from the pandemic. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's how we suppose somebody who's going to come in and sweep us up. But no, so very clearly not writing about a pandemic. But I do hope the third book, Sorting Sen, is coming out late February. And um, I hope our hero makes readers feel like a big, strong guy who will save, it's come in and whisk them away from it all because this is a bunch of crap and I'm tired of it. <laughs> It was, it was interesting because I finished the first book. I finished My Fallen Saint um, early in the pandemic and I was um, talking and I was working on the second one and now I'm working on the third one. Um, but I was talking to my editor, you know, I was like, so sh- what should I do? Should I go back in and edit it? And I said, and I really don't want to, you know, let's remove the mask. Let's pull out the hand sanitizer. Um, so I, I was like, should I just you know, drop a reference that they're going to a movie and it's, I don't know, Guardians of the Galaxy. So I'm, you know, dating it at a certain time. And and her takeaway really was, no, just it's, you've never said it's your whatever. So just, you know, readers are just living in a time and a place and a universe where that's the world that you live in. And, but I have to say, I don't know about you guys, but I get squidgy every time I watch, I, I write people shaking hands now, you know? It's like, it's, it's like, I just like, no, don't do that. I, I've never been a fan of shaking hands anyway. I've always thought it's like, you know, why do I want to do this weird, strange ritual or kissing, you know, people <laughs> that you barely know the air kissing. I've, I guess I'm very monk that way, but, um, I but, feel like yeah. hugging, you know, there are huggers yeah. out there and I'm not a hugger. So I'm not a hugger either. And then yeah. I feel bad about not being a hugger, but now I don't have to anymore. I mean, yeah, I'm, there you go. You know, so. <laughs> I'm writing right. about Spaniards who greet everybody with two kiss cheeks. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I know. So I am a passionate romance reader all the time. Um, and, and you guys mentioned the stigma about it, which I was not aware prior to being an independent bookseller that a lot of independent bookstores carry that stigma onto their mm-hmm. customers um, so, because I was blessed to always live in this area with this bookstore that has always been romance friendly and Katie Budget Books the owner when she started was a huge romance reader so not including romance was just never an option um, so I just wasn't aware that was a thing until I got into more industry-wide stuff and was like what why would you not want to sell all these books? Like romance readers are voracious. They read so many books, take their money. Um, but I particularly have loved reading romance during the pandemic because of that escape, mm-hmm. right? That that it always is that way. It kind of takes you away to this gorgeous other world where you can just like be in that for a while. There was a very um, well-known independent bookstore in a town that I live sort of close to. And I went in when Release Me came out, the first Damien Stark book. And um, it had been on New York Times multiple weeks, USA Today multiple weeks. And we'd gone in to so I could sign some copies there because we figured they would have it and they didn't. And so I went up to the customer service desk and I'm like, do you guys, and they have a small romance section, but it's very small. And I asked you guys, and, and also I was local, right? So, you know, and they also, and they've carried, they carried my Demon Hunting Soccer Mom series back in the day, which is not romance. And um, so I went up to them and I'm like, can you look this up? You know, maybe it's sold out. And they're like, oh no, we don't carry that. And I'm like, oh, why not? And they're like, well, you know, cause there's 
it's not super BDSM if you've read it. It's 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 a lot of in the sex is very much an integral part of the story, but it's not hardcore BDSM. So, but they were they were they were like, well, we just don't carry that kind of book. Literally beneath him on the ledge was Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh. okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's like okay if you hit the if you hit the icon level I guess it doesn't count anymore but I was just like really this is the, and it is you see that stigma of well we're not going to carry those kind of books you know wink wink nudge nudge it's like really because I just I don't believe that there's I don't think that any other genre gets as much mail as we do about how we've helped people through hard situations or yeah, I got yeah. so much mail after 9-11 my heroine in this in the Stark series is a cutter, and I've gotten so many mail, much mail from people who've said that um, who are cutters or recovered, and it says it's helped them. And you know, it's it's I don't understand the stigma. I just think it's ridiculous. But there you go. And and I do think the fact that you had never heard that is is a testament to all the work that so many people have done mm -hmm. to get it to this space where that you a obviously very intelligent person didn't even know that was around because as a lifelong fan that's you know all I knew was indie indie bookstores being incredibly hostile to you know not just indie bookstores indie bookstores being hostile to romance but then going into going into the Barnes and Noble it was one it was two shelves always way in the back. And there was a stigma about even being in the aisle. You know, I was buying them in eighth grade at the B Dalton's and it was, you know, one bookshelf as far in the back as it could go. And um, the revolution I've seen has just been, and especially in the last two or three years, how India has completely embraced it mm -hmm. um, has been phenomenal. And I'm glad that was an information that you didn't have. That's, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so lucky. Although we did run into a little trouble at our old location, we had to rearrange some sections because of space issues where some sections were getting larger and some were getting smaller. And we didn't really think about all the implications of that until we had our erotica section at right at the end of our religious nonfiction. And we did get some <laughs> complaints about that. But other than that, everything's always been great here with that her. wouldn't bother me but i guess i can see some people's <laughs> points of view wouldn't bother me either but <laughs> some little old ladies looking at religion just moved to the next case and we're like uh oh like, that is different that's a different section sorry <laughs> so audience if you have any questions go ahead and type them in the chat or the q a we are happy to take your questions also otherwise i will continue to commandeer the conversation i am totally fine with that I did see my mom pop up in the chat and I think she invited both of you to the vineyard whenever you're interested. So there you go. You have oh my gosh. Well, you know, I love wine. It's right there yeah. in my bio. <laughs> Field trip. Yeah, absolutely. Field trip. Okay. So do you guys remember what, well, okay. Rather than talk about what got you into romance, because I feel like we sort of talked about that while we were talking about what got you into writing romance, some of the books that brought you in. Have you read anything lately that you really loved? I'm reading I, um, the, the Widow of Rose House right now by Diana Biller. And that is so incredible. It's a great Halloween read. Um, she is a defamed woman, just like the, you know, Society hates her, her um, now dead husband just completely demolished her name. And she has come back to New York society in 1920. It's like, what is that era called? Kind of that uh, golden age? That kind of like high society, I guess 1900s. I'm obviously not reading it that closely. <laughs> Um, anyway, she comes back to New York society and she's just, but she's come to um, buy a house and re this beautiful mansion and renovate it for, um, and to do a book about it, about how, how home decoration can be for everybody and the house is haunted. And she uh -huh. comes across this really famous inventor. His whole family is famous and he's fascinated in tracking ghosts. And so he's kind of the beta and she's kind of the grumpy one. And he's so tall and he's so hot. And his name is Sam. And just the descriptions, I think she might have based them on Sam Winchester from Supernatural. And I have an intense. Oh, I love him. <laughs> I think, I think, I think, and I'm, I'm totally don't have no proof of this, but I think her Sam in, in the Whatever Rose House might be based on Sam Winchester. So I am so, I am so team Sam. Okay. Yeah. 
I know everybody else is team Dean. I'm team Sam. <laughs> this is, that's, that's me and me, uh, the reflection. That's me and Jensen Ackles. Oh, that's Dean. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, he, oh, I, cool. Nothing against <laughs> Dean. <laughs> oh, I love him though. He's, he's prettier, but <laughs> Sam, I just love Sam because, you know, he's like brainy he's and, uh, and he's tall. I'm five, nine. I like tall men. So whatever i recently i recently read um years ago d davis wrote a historical time travel called um everything in its time which is um she we were critique partners back then and it was it's truly even had i never met her it would have been one of my favorite books i loved it so much and she just put out a related um novella and i read that recently it's called winner's kiss it's so awesome i love historical romance probably because there is no risk of me writing it as I already told you guys, because I would have to research everything with every book. So I love that. I um, uh, read Helen's book right before my cutoff because I tend to not read um, when I'm writing, I'll stop and I won't read romance, I'll read sci-fi fantasy. So I was reading the Dune series after that. So, and it was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. It was my bedtime book, which kept me up past my bedtime a lot. So yes, yeah, so I highly recommend it. And um. Before that, I had I was late to the party, but I um, read Red, White, and Royal Blue, um, which I really enjoyed. It had um, it had such a cute cover, and it sounded like a lot of fun. I have to admit, I don't usually I'm I'm not um, I'm not reading that. It, it's not really YA. It, I thought it was YA at first, so I hesitated. But it's not really YA. But it was just a lot of fun. And and my go-to series is J.D. Robb's um, uh, In Death series, which is romance meets procedural mystery so those are those are kind of my go-to's uh, I actually have just made uh, a promise <coughs> to myself that I'm going to read more because I love to read it's a huge escape but I'm I've, I'm gonna have nine releases this year and so I've been working my butt off writing and editing and all this stuff so by the end of the day I don't really want to look at any more words <laughs> So I've had a couple people uh, recommend that I try audiobooks, and I have. I do. I walk around the house listening yeah, to audiobooks, but I tend to listen to nonfiction. But um, but yeah, it's one I wouldn't read without them. I actually started doing some classics on Spotify. Uh, I am one of those really weird romance writers who had never read Pride and Prejudice. I have now read it, or rather, I've listened to it. It was excellent. It was so good. It was hilarious too. Um, and then I also uh, listened to Jane Eyre, another classic on Spotify. So that was cool. Uh, as far as reading, you know, actual reading, um, I was uh, able to read an arc of uh, this new vampire motorcycle uh, book called Bane's Choice by Alyssa Day, which comes out in a week or two. And was excellent. If you like vampires and motorcycles, be sure to pick it up. Um, so that was my latest read and I enjoyed it. One of my favorite things about this panel is seeing Angelina's face when one of you ladies answers a question like <laughs> about having nine books coming this year. <laughs> my eyes just get this big. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk heroes for a minute. How, how, like how? Like I know you get the question about who inspires them and I've seen enough romance authors faces when they get asked that question to know you don't want that question. Like it's probably <laughs> not a real person and if it is, you're not gonna tell us. But how, as you write more books, do you make so many just phenomenal sexy men that don't feel the same? Like, and, and is that even a thought process? Like, oh, yeah. Do you if worry this one sounds too much like this other one? It is for me because I'm a big fan of the tortured alpha hero. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I always worry about that. Gee, does, does this guy sound too much like the, the other guy? So um, what I try to do is, is dialogue is a very good tool for that. Have them say different things, have them have different mannerisms. And then of course their backstory. They can, there are a million ways to create a tortured guy. So uh, the backstory can be completely different, but that is a worry I have with every new hero. <laughs> I probably should have it, but I don't have it too much because, and I think it's because of the backstory, because that's always the first thing is the hero's backstory. That's the, always the first thing I come up with. And um, yeah, may, maybe not always, there's been a lot of books, but usually that's the first thing I come up with. And, and Helen's right. There's so much that comes from that backstory that, um, 
that I don't really worry that they're, that they're going to be too much alike. I, I do worry about sometimes if I really get into the zone and I'm really writing really fast, that what's going to happen is my words are going to come up and the little words that I tend to, to pull out and, um, and, and that just say, oh, you know, Julie wrote that book, um, which is fine. So long as it's not, you know, every single character sounds exactly the same. So that's always like a, a specific pass is to go and make sure that they all have their own voice and their own way of talking and, and their own kind of who they are. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, you, you always want them to be, to be unique, but I mean, it's, it's, it's an under the surface kind of worry, I guess is, is what I'm trying to say. I'm like Helen, I pants as well. And the thing I always know about him really well, I, I know his backstory. I also know his profession. And for whatever reason, for me, these um, writing these books about these powerful people, I do want them, I want them to be, have innate integrity, even if they're screwing around with that, but I want them to have innate integrity. A part of them having innate integrity is being really able to display competence porn, I love that term, but really being good at what they do. There could be all these other things falling apart in lines, but really being good at what they do. And when I become interested in what they're doing professionally, which feeds them, both my females and my males, it feeds them, um, that really allows me mm -hmm. to follow their characters and their characters seem, I hope, become very individual on their own because they're being led that way because you know if they're a scientist if they're a grower if they're a you know um ex-military that really does inform who they are and because mm -hmm. i'm not i mean i guess i'm going to run into trouble if i try to write you know five people in a crew doing the same thing but um but that it, I want them to be really good at it. I want the, it to be innate and, and integral to who they are. And so it, it so far, it hasn't been, um, there's a lot of books stuffed under the cover, not as many as they've gotten published, but there's a lot of books I've got stuffed under the bed. So far, running into, um, with my heroes, running into um, traits that are similar has not been an issue. I wonder about my heroines now that I think about that. That actually might be a little bit, um, but anyway, that's how I, you know, differentiate them. Okay, and so then let's talk about the heroines, because one of the things that I love about romance is that it just feels as a genre kind of feminist that because the stories are told generally from the woman's perspective, and with her ultimate happiness at the end, right, like, not, obviously, the heroes are happy too, but it feels very much like you're really rooting for the heroine, like, I get mad at the hero when he's screwing up, and when the heroine's screwing up, I'm like, okay, but I understand your motivations, honey, so, like, <laughs> Is it difficult to come up with different heroines? I mean, Angelina, you sort of, sort of answered that already. And I don't, like Julie, you had mentioned having a heroine who was a cutter and, and yeah. those backstories, because they're the female characters and you probably identify with them a little bit more, is it harder giving them those hard backstories, I guess? With that, that story was kind of personal. I'm not, I, I have never cut, but, um, but I was anorexic. And so it was sort of that whole kind of having that kind of, um, self-harm issue dealing with that, whatever, whatever that came up from. But, um, but I, I think all of my heroines have a little bit of some aspect of me in them somehow. I'm either it's, they're a little spacey because I'm a little spacey or they have that sort of angsty thing that Nikki had. Um, uh, the heroine in the Saint series is, is pretty strong and determined that she's going to do this. And she's very, you know, she's very much going after her goals, which I've always pretty much done my whole life. So I think that, that there are, that if I had, if I had to sit down and look at all of my heroines over time, I could probably go, yeah, that's a little bit of me more so than the heroes. I mean, I think the heroes have a little bit of me too. I think it's impossible to be a writer and not just like an actor has to put some of themselves into whatever character they're playing. I feel like that's what writers do. Like we're basically, there's no way I could act on a stage, but I can do it on the pages of a book. You know, I can put myself into those characters and play the parts. Um, but sometimes it's harder to find the heroines. It's like, what's the, sometimes when I know just who I want the hero to be of a story, which was what happened with Saint, then it's like, okay, I've got this really interesting guy who's got this story that's, that's going to take three books to really reveal it. You think you know what it is, but it, you don't until we really get to the end. Then who's the woman who can, who's going to match him? And you're, so you're sitting there for days going, well, I don't know. It's, you know, and then it's like, oh, okay. 
and then it all falls t falls together. It's I, I I wish sometimes that I was a little more um, note card. You know, here's my note card. This is the way it's going to go, and this is the way it's going to go, and I know it all, but it's all very fluffy and mystical and yeah. hard to describe. I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Julie that there's a little bit of me and all my heroines as well, mm -hmm. and um, and probably in my heroes as well, but I don't ever actually think of that, but probably like you said, you know, it's, it's kind of impossible to create a character and not have a little bit of yourself in mm -hmm. it. But um, uh, my heroines definitely. And um, there's one heroine that I have that is so much like me, um, except she has blonde hair and green eyes, but uh, she's a lot like me. When people ask me which character that have you written that is the most like you, it's she's the one I answer. And um, but even even all the other ones, I mean, there's just little aspects. I actually also wrote a cutter uh, in one of my uh, series, and I have never cut either, so it required some research. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we've all, I mean, we're women, uh, puberty, being a woman, it, they're hard, it's hard <laughs> sometimes. And so um, my heroines really all have a little bit of me in them, and um, it's not always pretty but that's okay. <laughs> I think one of the issues I run into because of the kind of power dynamic I'm playing with is I do get reviews where I love the hero, hated, you know, I hate the heroine, the heroine's a bitch. I get, you know, I do get the things that people allow our heroes, they don't allow sometimes those same foibles and journeys and power plays for a woman to have, at least some reviewers, it's it's difficult for or some readers, it's difficult for them to, you know, if they don't like the woman, the incident on the page or or see a vulnerability in her that they can kind of bomb into, they, they don't like them as much. And so I do kind of, you know, manage that a little bit with my heroines. I, I say that I write alpha heroines and what that looks like and that it does look different when it's, a, it's an alpha heroine versus an alpha hero. And that an alpha heroine isn't, you know, doesn't, isn't defined, doesn't need to be defined by, you know, being able to kick ass or having lots of money, that it's kind of an innate strength that she has and how she carries herself in the world. And so that is one of the things that I, you know, is equitable in my heroines um, so far and um, is something that readers enjoy or something that they absolutely don't. So, and that's <laughs> fine because not every, one writer is gonna be for every person, so. No, I, there's a lot of things that, um, if you ever feel bad, go read my run, one star reviews on Craving. You'll, you'll feel a lot better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, I don't read them, but I tell everybody else, you know, if you feel like you're not going to make it as an author, go read those. You'll feel so much better. But um, I get, this cracks me up when I get, um, because all my, all my heroes are alpha and, and tortured pretty much across the board. And so they're not always nice. Okay. And um, I get, I'll get a bad review that says something like, I really didn't like how he treated her in this scene. And, and I look at that and I'm like, well, well, I didn't really either. But he has <laughs> growth, you know. <laughs> that scene was integral to who he is, and um, so yeah. I mean, you're always going to get haters. <laughs> it's part of this business, unfortunately. It is something that I'm like. We actually we are writing <laughs> romance, but we're also writing genre fiction. You know, which you need both, and you need conflict, and you need absolutely. You know, Characters aren't really always easy. nice. People aren't always nice. You know. No, so, yeah. Exactly, and and you know. <laughs> Does is me sometimes that the the allowances that they give sci-fi and they give mystery mm -hmm. somehow, that somehow romance you know characters are supposed to be you know puppy and roses at the beginning of the page but again that's not all readers and it's easy to take the bad ones too easy to heart that's for sure yeah, yeah. I, need, I need I need more I need my knocks that's for that I do well and as a reader <laughs> if it was all puppies and roses from the very beginning that's not interesting like where's the conflict coming from mm -hmm. and if one of your characters is likable all the time that means the other one has to be a jerk the whole time <laughs> in order for the conflict and then why would you want them together right okay so we did have a question from celeste she said who is your fantasy audio reader for your stories i had sebastian york for one of mine he does a lot of romance. Um, he was awesome. Um, uh, for women, I love Lucy Rivers. 
um, Ava Erickson, uh, who are some more guys I like, Joe Arden. Um, oh, I just got one for my next three Steel Brothers stories who I had never heard of before. And he had the sexiest, lowest voice. His name was Troy Duran, I think. I had never heard of him, but when I re when I heard his tape, I was like, oh my God, that's the one I want. <laughs> I confess that I don't pay attention to who the readers are and I don't listen to my own audiobooks because I can't have another voice of a character in my head. So other people do that um, for the ones that I've produced. And usually I, I it's done by the publisher. Um, as a as an audiobook reader, the only there's only been two that I've really paid attention to. So I think Scott Brick is amazing as a reader, um, and then there was a guy years and years ago named Tom Somebody rather who did the interview with the Vampire Books, and I thought he was amazing. But um, but for the most part, I'm I'm a terrible person because I don't I don't know who the readers are. I'm sorry. I'm so glad that they that I interact with some of them sometimes, but I can't say that I've listened to the ones who've done my books because I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't, I can't, I wouldn't be able to write them again because I hear somebody else in my head. It just, I can't, I, it, it would, it would totally weird me out. When I finish a series, maybe I will, but I don't ever seem to be able to finish series. So, <laughs> <laughs> Julie, it's funny you say that because I've had two books out. So I've had the same, I, so that's what I have to go on. But I, her name is Scarlett Hayes and um, uh -huh. she's phenomenal. And there's Spanish in my book and there's also a variety of accents, different right. levels accents in my books whether they're you know and so she modulates that beautifully she's got this beautiful you know um uh not rough but just just this beautiful deep uh -huh. female voice but she does the men so great but when I read my books and my stuff back I hear her voice now and fortunately you she's like amazing it. and when she you know the first book was cold but the second book she knew the characters and she knew the mm -hmm. world so she just literally turned it into it was like I was reading, you know, listening to something new. But so fortunately, that's it awesome. Works. Yeah. yeah, but I could <laughs> if it didn't. I yeah, I'd be host. <laughs> yeah, but oh, there's said, certain words, and I can hear her saying them. You know, I said that I didn't know any others, but I will say I I, I listen to the JD Robb books because I do not have time to read seventy five thousand books actually in print, but I love them. So I get them when they come out and I listen to them in about a day. And I cannot remember her name because I'm terrible, um, but she is amazing. She has become Eve in my head. I mean, she is Eve, she is Eve Dallas. There's just no way about it. She's got a wonderful voice. So I definitely, I, I fan over the ones that I listen to and I will return a book if, it, if I can't stand the voice. I've not ever run across a romance one that I haven't been able to stand, but there's been a couple of um, fantasy books that I've listened to that the voice was just really strange. And so that it's, it's definitely important that you have a, a narrator who has a good voice, I mean, and fits the story. Yes, I have not read the first book in your series yet, Angelina, and so now I'm doing it on audio because you just totally sold me on one. <laughs> you finish yeah. in your book. It's like, I really wanna hear this. So now that I know that you totally support the narrator, I'm gonna do it. I was listening to it and walking down the street and this is, you know, my words and audio, like just, and with the audible guy in the beginning, like, you know, the audible, his little audible thing and that it was happening in front of my name, I lost it. But um, <laughs> I was listening, I was like walking down my home, my like street in town and I'm listening to a sex scene and I, re I was reacting like a 15 year old, like, <gasps> and I wrote it. <laughs> it <was so> <laughs> dirty <laughs> and when the way she did it and, so she had me hooked because she did such a good job. But yeah, I just, I called my mom. I'm like, I, I, it's so dirty. Why didn't you tell me my book is super dirty? <laughs> but like so deliciously dirty though. Like it's, all yeah, of the I books. So. I think so. Just deliciously <laughs> sexy. <laughs> all right. Well, it is nine o'clock. So thank you much, so much ladies for joining us. This was a lot of fun. Um, attendees, if any of you have not purchased the books yet, we do have Helen Hart's and Angelina, oh, that's the wrong way. Helen Hart's and Angelina <laughs> Lopez's in physical. Um, we have Jay Kenner's on the way. They just have not arrived yet. That shipment got delayed because shipping and COVID. Thank you, COVID. Um, <laughs> but they are all available in ebook. And um, the link on your confirmation email has all of those books in all of the available formats. So you can order through there. So thank you attendees for joining us. Thank you so much, Helen and Angelina and Julie. This has been so much fun. It has, thank you for having us. This is yes, amazing. thank you so much for inviting me. And thank this you for writing the sexy escapist fiction we all need right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
<laughs> have a good night. Yeah, Thank you. You too. Care. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. <laughs>